Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by AJC. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with Jewish Insider. You can sign up for Jewish Insider's daily kickoff by visiting jewishinsider.com. We are delighted to be joined today by Lord John Mann, the United Kingdom government's independent advisor on anti-Semitism. Lord Mann has a strong record of combating anti-Semitism and his many years in Parliament, in the British Parliament and as the former head of the all-party parliamentary group against anti-Semitism. He's also a dear friend of AJC. In May 2009, he received AJC's prestigious Jan Karski Award in recognition of his commitment to fighting anti-Semitism. He has spoken several times at the AJC Global Forum, most recently in 2019, He's also visited a number of AJC regional offices and we cherish his friendship. Moderating today's conversation is Simone Rodin von Bucket, Director of AJC Europe. After we hear from Lord Mann and Simone, we will take your questions. You may email your questions to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or use the Q&A chat feature in Zoom. Simone, you and Lord Mann have the floor. Thank you very much, Jillian. I would like to welcome our viewers around the world who are with us today. I'm extremely happy and honored uh, for the second time since we launched, I believe, AJC Advocacy Anywhere to welcome our very dear friend, Lord John Mann today, uh, with whom we have, as Jolien just said, had the privilege to be partnering for many, many years. John, if we can start out, um, not everybody, I believe, knows you so well on this call. Many, many certainly do. Uh, you have been fiercely committed um, to fighting anti-Semitism for many years. You have taken political, you have taken personal risks, your family has been threatened. Could you tell our audience maybe a little bit about what prompted you to get involved and why, for you, the fight against anti-Semitism is so important. Well, thank you, Simone. And it's a pleasure to be with you again today. And for all these people who are participating, thank you for giving up your, your time. Why? Well, I was well brought up, is the answer. Good parents. Um, and really, it's as simple as that. I've been in a leadership position. I was, I still am a member of parliament, now in the House of Lords, previously the House of Commons for nearly 20 years. My definition of leadership, if you're elected or appointed to a senior position in the state, in the democracy of the country, is that you will tackle and fight discrimination and hatred. And therefore, it's your responsibility to combat anti-Semitism. And that's what I've done. And I've never given more than 5% of my time until recently, when it's now, I'm now full-time as a government advisor. That's an unusual difference. And there's only one government advisor. So having one person giving 95% of their time is, I think, probably quite helpful. But before it's 5% of my time. But having the advantage of representing no Jewish constituency, not being Jewish, nobody could accuse me of bias, of seeking votes, of seeking anything else, just doing what is right. And uh, it's what normal people do across the world. They do what is right. And can I indulge myself and tell you something new that I've discovered in the lockdown, Simone? Because Absolutely. It, I think it's an interesting story. It's a personal one. But I think it's a very wide relevance. 
we had a famous battle against the fascists in 1936 in the UK, the Battle of Cable Street, when the fascists were marching through London. There's lots of books written about it, photographs, artists' work. It's well known. Any student of the Nazi era and fascism will have heard of the Battle of Cable Street in London. But nobody has heard of the Battle of Holbeck Moor exactly two weeks before in the city where I come from, my family has lived for generations, the city of Leeds. And it's a really important story. In brief, the fascists came to Leeds in order to march through the Jewish community. They assembled on a small piece of grass known as Holbeck Moor. The poorest part of the city still is the poorest part of the city, where my family lived for generations. 30,000 local people turned out on that Sunday and physically removed the fascists from the city. The fascist leader Mosley was injured, 12 fascists were put in hospital, there was no photographs, no books written, no witness testimony put into film or on paper. Just stories told through families. In this lockdown, I've researched, and I can now say for factual certainty that my family was present and active in the Battle of Holbeck Moor. Wow. Normal people, 30,000 people fought the fascists, beat them. And this is the really important thing. What did they do the next day? They didn't run to the newspapers. They didn't write books. They went back to work. They carried on normal life because that's what normal people do. Fascists turn up in your area. Normal people get rid of them. Decent, normal people. And 30,000 people just carried on with their normal life. I think that's a very powerful message. That's why I'm Lord Man of Holbeck Moor. Because I'm going to tell that story everywhere I go. Because when normal people stand up, as they did in the election in Britain, normal people standing up and saying, no, we don't accept anti-Semitism that the Jewish community should take great comfort from that and encouragement. And what we need to do is make sure that normal people are educated, informed and ready to take action on the side of decency. And it's a key part of what my priorities are. Wow, what, what an incredibly inspiring story. Um, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, actually, that leads me directly to, to sort of my next question. You, you, you recently wrote an op-ed that you published on the AJC website um, about the whistleblowers who spoke on a BBC program about the anti-Semitism that they were seeing, that they were witnessing in the Labour Party. And your piece speaks about these normal people. Uh, and you mentioned two things. You say consistency and consequences. Could you explain to our audience what you mean by that and why it's important these two words to it in the fight against anti-Semitism? Well, again, I pay huge homage to those normal people who were whistleblowers. Most of them clerical staff, not famous names ever but people we should celebrate. Administrative staff who did the right thing and spoke out against wrongs that were being done against the Jewish community. That's normal people being decent, being normal. But consistency, our approach needs to be consistent. That's why the IHRA, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, definition of anti-Semitism is so vital. A consistent approach to anti-Semitism in the UK, 
in the Western world, across the whole of the world. That definition makes it easier to have consistency because it defines what is anti-Semitism. It gives us all a benchmark. However little we're involved, it gives a benchmark. That's vital. So our approach must be consistent. If we all just do our own thing, then we're not going to win. But if we do our bit and we're consistent in it, then we will win. Because we have the majority, by a long way the majority. But consequences. The one difference I have with those brave people in Holbeck Moor, the 30,000, is uh, they created consequences for the fascists. They removed them. But actually, now going back retrospectively, I encourage more of them to tell their story, to speak out, to let them know what the consequences for the fascists, for the anti-Semites were. We've got to create consequences for the anti-Semites. And that means, I spoke to a group of young Jewish people just last week, people in their early 20s, most of them, some of whom privately messaged me saying that before they'd been scared to challenge anti-Semitism, but now they felt more empowered. And a vital, vital message. All of us need to do our little bit in calling out and challenging anti-Semitism and giving the anti-Semites consequences. Not exaggerating ever, not overstating, not crying wolf, never. But also never ignoring, pretending it will go away. And that's why I like working with the AJC so much. Because the AJC has never overstated the problems. But it's also never understated or hidden away from the problems. That honesty of approach is vital for us to win. And you do that. Uh, and I praise and credit the AJC. And I implore, implore you to continue that approach forever. But that then creates consequences for the anti-Semites. Thank you, John. We certainly won't, uh, won't abandon the battle um, and we continue to partner, I hope, with you in the future. Now, speaking of consequences, um, the UK Equality and Human Rights Commission launched an investigation into the Labour Party's anti-Semitism uh, problem under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. What do you expect of the Commission's finding, uh, findings and how do you think Labour under the current leadership will respond? And do you think there will be consequences uh, for Jeremy Corbyn and those surrounding him? Well, he obviously thinks there'll be consequences because he's employed his own lawyer um, and you don't employ a lawyer unless you have some concerns. So he thinks there are going to be some consequences. That's self-evident. The, I don't know what the Equalities Commission has concluded because it's not yet public and it would be entirely inappropriate for them to give me and people like me any advance notice. But they will report in the very imminent future their report has been sent to the Labour Party, that I do know. And I would be surprised, very surprised and shocked, if they weren't highly critical of how the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn operated in dealing with anti-Semitism. I do not see, with the evidence they have, how they conclude anything other than it was a total failure of leadership, of systems, of structures. What will the Labour Party response under the new leader Keir Starmer be? I hope, but also I think it will be robust. Those two terms, consistency consequences, 
than what I've put to Keir Starmer as what his approach should be. The Labour Party needs to be consistent in how it handles anti-Semitism. It hasn't been. And it needs to create consequences, including removing all the anti-Semites from the Labour Party. And however they do that, frankly, that's for the Labour Party to solve. But if they don't do it, the Labour Party will again pay a huge electoral price when we have another general election. I think Keir Starmer, as a new leader, fully understands it. I think he has a feel for the Jewish community. His wife is Jewish and he has children with his wife. Therefore, it would be very, very worrying and problematic if he weren't robust and didn't make it a top priority. So far he has, I think he will continue to do so. If so, the Jewish community in the UK will show its appreciation in their words and he will win votes that he lost from Jewish people who were lifelong Labour supporters who refused to vote for the Labour Party in the last election. Thank you, John. It's, uh, it's encouraging to hear. Um, I was just before we sort of go to two other topics that I would like to talk to you about. I was wondering whether you could speak to us a little bit about um, your actual position and your role um, today. Um, what is it exactly you do? What are your goals? Who do you report to? Um, do you only focus on the United Kingdom? Uh, do you also work with other advisors or commissioners uh, around the world and in Europe? Just give us a little bit of a broad picture of what your role is today. Well, my specific remit given by the Prime Minister is to report to government on all problems and issues that the UK government needs to know about anti-Semitism. So that's what I'm doing. Obviously, therefore, I need to focus on the security of the British Jewish community. I need to focus on issues such as the internet and its impact, policing. I need to focus on education in schools. And I'm appointed for five years. I'm independent of government and I retain a seat in the House of Lords in Parliament. So whether government likes it or not, I will tell them what they need to hear. And- And you're not shy. And I'm not shy. And you know, they, um, they've given me a budget that assists, but they don't pay me. So, you know, I don't answer to government. I suppose they could sack me, but if they sack me, that doesn't really work for them. I'll just become the independent, independent advisor then. So that won't happen. Um, and so far I'm working successfully and closely with the Boris Johnson government. I hope that continues. Um, but if they get it wrong, I will tell them. And if they fail to listen to me and get it wrong again, then I'll make sure the world knows about it. That's my role. So uh, I will not be uh, silent on important issues, um, but I have another hat as well. So I am resurrecting the ICCA, the International Coalition of Parliamentarians Combating Anti-Semitism. Um, and I set it up with uh, the great legislator from Canada, Owen Kotler, I think in 2008 in, uh, in Jerusalem. And it's done some very important work, particularly with the IHRA declaration on anti-Semitism, which to our international conferences in London, in Ottawa and in Berlin, I think we kept on the agenda. Well, I'm resurrecting the executive again because somebody needs to be pursuing the adoption of the IHRA declaration across the world, both by governments and politicians, but also by 
civil society organisations. And in the UK, we're targeting as the first priority every British university uh, and every Premier League football club adopting the declaration. Some have, and we're about to make further announcements. And there are announcements you will like, Simone. <laughs> it sounds interesting. I'm very intrigued, I have to say. Um, of course, uh, on the IRA definition, as you know, this has also been a, uh, a priority for AJC for a very long time. And uh, again, an issue that we um, are very happy to partner with uh, you as well on. Um, I'll come to the football, the soccer part later on, but I, you, you mentioned um, just now also the issue of online hatred. Um, there was recently a story about a British rapper called Wiley, and I admit I've never heard of him before, who had about a half a million followers on Twitter. He went on one of the worst anti-Semitic rants I have personally seen in, in, in a while. Twitter was extremely slow in responding, uh, prompting a 48-hour walkout by many in Britain, including yourself. And as a friend and ally uh, in solidarity, we at AJC also joined this walkout. Are there any lessons to be learned from this? And more generally, what can be done to more to fight anti-Semitism and hate online? Well... People power is very effective. And this was a real young people's grass movement uh, campaign to boycott Twitter for 48 hours. And we'd like to thank you for joining in with that protest. That helped us. And it had a huge impact and Twitter knows this so people need to be less tolerant of the hatred online but that's why our legislation will be important if you're a young black footballer playing in the UK very well known why should you have to suffer racist abuse every day online with no consequences for the purveyor of hatred unless you can get the police to arrest them? And we have done that. But that's difficult to do. Some of these accounts are anonymous. If there are thousands of people with the same spreading the same hatred, then do you spend all of your life having to do it? Well, my view is no. The companies themselves who make huge profits should have systems and a code of practice that's underpinned by legislation so that you or I, Simon, could hold them to account if somebody abuses us and they fail to act. It ought to be straightforward because every broadcaster and every newspaper in the UK and I think in most of the Western world has systems in place they have to abide by. What this man did on Twitter and then on Instagram and then on YouTube, he could not do on radio, television or newspapers in the United Kingdom. So I want a fair market where the internet companies are competing fairly with the other broadcasters, the other publishers. And I want the individual who is abused to have the ability to do something about it. So we're gonna legislate and that will be the target of the legislation. Thank you, thank you, John, for, for the explanation. Um, now, going to uh, the football that you mentioned early on, uh, you are particularly committed in, in, in working and involving uh, football clubs or for our US owned audiences, soccer clubs um, on fighting anti-Semitism. Could you tell us a little bit about 
the work that you are doing with those football clubs and why you believe this is so important? Well, the two best examples of clubs that we're working with are Chelsea, based in London, and Borussia Dortmund, based in Germany. They're currently the two best examples, both openly committed to fighting anti-Semitism, both have adopted the full IRA declaration and are using it. The importance is that it's a statement of their values, their very famous brands, but far more than that, they have their supporters, millions of supporters across the world who buy the shirts, who watch the matches, watch them on the television, who are happy when they win, sad when they lose. What we want to see is those values of decency, of normality, enshrined in these sports clubs. And the supporters who, for example, use the Chelsea badge and name online in their bio, in their handle, and are anti-Semitic, we want the club to invite them in and educate them with our help so that the club is taking action to ensure its own supporters are sticking with the ethos and values of the club, but also so that its brand isn't damaged. The brand of Chelsea, the brand of Dortmund is damaged. If their badge, their colours, their name is associated with racism. And yeah, they can sanction people. If you want to be a racist, don't buy a ticket at Chelsea. Because if Chelsea find out you're a racist, you won't be getting a ticket. You won't be watching anymore. I think that's a powerful sanction. And you imagine, Simone, if you're a 16-year-old at home wearing your Chelsea shirt or your Dortmund shirt or any other club we can get to adopt the IRA declaration and use it, and you get a letter from your favourite player or from the famous coach asking you to come and visit the club. And when you get there, you're educated about anti-Semitism. My judgment is that will have a far greater impact than all the work that we could put together as organisations, as people, because it's getting to people that we would find more difficult to reach. And of course, that's where the problem usually is. And so it's got an enormous potential, including in the US, with big sports clubs. And we don't just see this for sport, but sport is such an easy example and such a powerful reach. You imagine if a famous sports club with lots of supporters in the US, big stadium that people go to, did the same thing to a 16 year old supporter, whoever, from their favorite player or their favorite coach or the owner, to have a huge impact. So we want to spread this across the US as well. Wonderful, very powerful indeed. Now, before I let uh, the audience, uh, and I know that there are already many questions coming in, ask their questions, I have one last question that I would like to ask you. Uh, Anti-Semitism has also become a problem, of course, in the United States. We've seen murders. Uh, we've seen a huge increase of anti-Semitic acts over the past couple of years. From your perspective, are there any lessons to be learned from the British experience for the United States? And what advice would you give? Oh, wow. Well, 
we can give you advice i think and help on dealing with those sports clubs that's an easy one for us i think the cst community security trust can give a lot of help and advice on good security systems and relations with the state the policing in security of institutions synagogues schools community buildings i think we are uh, world leaders with the cst and i think increasingly we will give i don't know about advice but help on dealing with anti-semitism on the university campus but in return you can give us help and advice i was talking last night with the new head of the community security trust i don't know if he's listening online but i'm sure simone you or someone else will be able to tell him if not but we're keen to have a session with david harris guiding us on advice he can give on intersectionality on relations with the black community i think we can learn something from you and the beauty of listening from yourselves is we'll get an honest assessment in private um, of what works and what doesn't work and why and uh, we think that would be very valuable now for us in the in in future weeks so there's a request i think we're always open to steal your best ideas to learn from your wisdom but we're also happy if we can share our experience to put our time and resource into doing so you know none of us is going to succeed on our own if we work together we're going to be far stronger I couldn't agree more. And on this, first of all, I think I'm sure that David Harris has received the message because I'm, I know he's listening in. And uh, on this uh, on this hopeful note of working together and together we are stronger. I'm passing this on to Jillian. Thank you, Simone. And we're getting a lot of questions from our worldwide audience. The first one comes from Shrub Kempner, an AJC Board of Governors member from Galveston, Texas who asks, has the coronavirus pandemic made a difference in the extent or the intensity of anti-Semitism in the UK? The answer is so far, no. However, my advice note to the British government, which I've shared with the UK Jewish communal leaders, is that it will. And the problem of anti-Semitism and the level of it will increase for two reasons, in my view. One is, there will be an economic downturn, hopefully small and not for long, but it's clear there will be job losses, and that will be a very important danger point as people look for someone to blame. And we know through history that the anti-Semites will be very active in blaming the Jews for the ills of society. Secondly, I'm just working on a paper now for the British government, which we will publish on the anti-vaxxers and anti-Semitism. And as a vaccine is created, or several vaccines, the same type, I'm sure, but different ownership across the world, and used the anti-vaxxers with their conspiracy theories will try and defy science and what i've noted looking in some detail is how those who are anti-vaxxers always have anti-semitic comments and anti-black comments as well in their feeds and so the anti-vaxxers are either encouraging or are supported by active, vehement anti-Semites. And that's a big danger point. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Our next question here comes from Richard Plotzker on Zoom, who says, this week, AJC had an interview with Elon Carr, the US State Department Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Can you explain in your position with the UK government how you interact with the State Department and with other anti-Semitism envoys? I work uh, closely with Elan Carr. Um, he, does a, he does a great job in my estimation. And I think if it wasn't for this coronavirus, we would have seen some of our initiatives operating now across the world and with other envoys uh, the german envoy felix klein who i know very well um, is part of a uh, a triumvirate of great expertise there and there are more who have been appointed uh, i've been in work with the italian envoy in recent days um, and this is a powerful tool particularly in consolidating the IRA definition into a wide array of countries and institutions. And so um, the more we work together, including Elan and myself, the more effective both of us will be. It's a very important ally, both because of the position and in his case, because of the personality, the integrity, the commitment he brings to the job. Thank you. Our next question here comes from Toby Bronstein in Sarasota and Jeffrey Goldings also asked this um, about education in the UK. As mentioned earlier, you said normal people need to be educated and informed and informed on the issues to stand up in good faith. So what's being done in the UK as far as education on this? We have education in the curriculum in schools, but I'm wanting to see it better evaluated to see what is succeeding and for us not to be complacent because clearly it's not succeeding well enough because we've seen rises in the last decade in anti-Semitism despite the education. So something is going wrong. I also think we need to face up to the painful reality that the brilliant role model survivors who've given their testimony in schools in many countries in the world and been used assiduously in the curriculum in the United Kingdom we will reach a time when there are no eyewitness testimony left to give in person. And therefore, the content of the education will be vital. And so over the five years, it's a top priority for me. It's not the first priority. There are other things I think need resolving in the first year or two. But over the five years I'm in post, it's a very high priority to look at the education and to help think through the world when we will not have eyewitness testimony from living people available to us. And we must prepare well in advance for that. And time is short. Thank you. Our next question here comes from Tamar Sella in Israel, who's asking, do you think that Brexit will harm or not harm European cooperation in the fight against anti-Semitism or even the EU's approach to Israel? No, I don't think it will harm it at all. Um, I think it's, uh, it's an important issue. It's a controversial issue. And in the UK, it remains a controversial issue. But in terms of the fight against anti-Semitism, no. I have no fears that it will be an impediment. It will neither improve nor worsen the ability in the UK, in the EU, and between us in fighting anti-Semitism. Thank you. The next question is from Jackie Rosenthal in Westchester, New York 
He says, I saw a headline earlier this week that the Henry Jackson Society published a survey that points to the fact that anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are prevalent within parts of the Muslim community in the UK. Um, from your perspective, is there anything specific that should be done to combat this form of anti-Semitism? Absolutely. My first ever report in 2006 identified the three key forms of anti-Semitism in the UK. From the left, when few people wanted to listen to that problem, I was highlighting it. From the right, which was well recognized, but I pointed out was still there. And from the Muslim community. And the Muslim community is the one that people have been the most reticent to deal with. And that means going into the Muslim community, engaging with the Muslim community, building strong alliances, defending the Muslim community against the problems they face as well. We don't do enough of that. And I am working assiduously at the moment to get platforms, not just with those who've always cooperated on faith leaders forums, but with those parts of the community which are the majority, who've not been part of those discussions, who don't engage with the Jewish community, have no idea about the Jewish community, because that's where the prejudice is by far the deepest, and to engage directly and find tools that succeed to engage directly with that. That has to be done. And my intention, my work program is to lead from the front in going there and doing it myself and learning the painful lessons of what fails, as well as sharing the lessons of what succeeds. Absolutely, thank you. The next question here comes from Karen Rosenfeld in Boston. It says, you mentioned the working definition as a helpful instrument. Once countries adopt it, what is done in terms of implementation? What should be done is that it doesn't lie in a dusty cupboard brought out every time you have a meeting with the AJC or another communal organization to tell them how good you are, that it's used practically and pragmatically. It's a working document. So if you're, a, if you're part of a government institution, how you use it with your staff, how you use it with the people that you interact with in the general public, how you deal with any anti-Semitic discourse, language, threatening behavior, and crucially, how you deal with it with things that are below the criminal threshold. If someone assaults you physically because you're Jewish, then we can get a criminal prosecution. But if someone calls you a name that's offensive and deliberately offensive, the chances of a criminal prosecution are incredibly low. We need to lower the bar in terms of consequences. That's what the IHRA definition allows us to do. And that's why institutions in civil society, like the universities, how does the university deal with anti-Semitism on campus. It gives it the benchmark, it gives it the tools for doing so. What we need to do as experts in the field is supplement that with clear advice, education, so that they can go further in how they use it and how they educate. And if done that way, hugely, hugely powerful and effective tool. And it doesn't stop as bringing in law enforcement when the criminal threshold has been breached and someone has broken the law of whatever country the offence takes place in. But they are a tiny minority of the hate incidents we need to deal with and create consequences with the mass of those which will never get beyond that criminal threshold. That's why it's so vital that it's a working document. Thank you. The next question is about college campuses. I'm from Beth Turkell in Chicago. 
who asks, from, from your perspective, why do universities seem to be the center of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? And what is the experience of a, a pro-Israel Jewish student on a UK campus? I think the experience is similar to a US campus. I don't think it's different. Of course, it varies from university to university. But my, uh, my daughter spent a year in university in in the United States. So I'm able to make a more direct comparison. I think it's comparable, the experience. Universities pride themselves on being the most tolerant part of society. And yet they accept abuse of Jewish students, which totally contradicts their ethos. That's why effective systems that empower Jewish students, that create consequences for the anti-Semites are so important. And that needs detail added to the IHRA definition in terms of the kinds of behaviors in universities that are unacceptable and enforcement of it, including from people outside. But the starting point is to get the universities to adopt the declaration. Otherwise, they have no benchmark, no toolbox in order to deal with the problem. And my experience is what they do is once a year, one of them will bring in the police because of the severity of the incident. Well, what about the thousands or tens of thousands of incidents where you haven't brought in the police? is my retort to that. That's what you should be dealing with. And we intend, and the British government has been absolutely clear in backing this vocally and in writing that every British university will use the IRA definition. Thank you. We're getting a lot of questions on the connection between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in the UK and what, what role the hatred of Israel plays in UK anti-Semitism. Um, I used to say that it was a lot on the left. What I've found in the last two years is that it's also there on the far right in ways in which I hadn't fully recognize the extent of and of course within the Muslim community where it's perhaps the most prevalent of all and it's a major part of the problem of anti-semitism people feel more comfortable in fact some take great pride if they describe themselves as anti-Zionist if you tell them they're anti-Semites, most of them don't like it, though some still take pride in it. If you call them racists, most don't like that. But it's the same thing. And so in our work, and it's again why having a definition of anti-Semitism is so powerful. Fighting that is crucial. And why in the universities? I think the, uh, the university's left orthodoxy on some issues is far more common and it's become a key part of left orthodoxy that Israel should be demonized and delegitimized. And that needs directly challenging and openly challenging. And people have been fearful or reluctant or cowardly in failing to do so. Which doesn't mean, of course, you can't criticize Netanyahu and his policies, just as in this country, lots of people criticize Prime Minister Boris Johnson, his policies. And there appears to be quite a lot of criticism of President Donald Trump in the US and his policies. But I haven't heard anybody attack Donald Trump's policies and call for the United States to be dismantled, for its people to be driven out. And that's a fundamental difference. 
and the difference is based on racism, that the world's only Jewish state is singularly picked out. And that Jewish person who proudly defines themselves as a Zionist is told they're not allowed to self-define. Well, everyone's allowed to self-define. And it's not for me to self-define for you or anybody else. And that includes everybody who says, I am Jewish and I'm proudly Zionist. That is your right. And I have no right to remove that from you. And that argument we need to put, again with consistency and consequences, more robustly, and people need to be less cowardly in challenging when the anti-Zionism cloak is used for what is in fact anti-Semitism. Thank you. The next question here comes from Naomi Hansen in Bethesda, Maryland, who says, you spoke about online hate speech earlier. Europe's laws are quite different from those in the US. So what do you think is the best way for the US to fight hate speech on social media? I've always said that the two key things are legislation, if that's possible. And I fully understand the US traditions and perspectives and constitution. And the other is the pressure of people. I noted the commercial boycott of Facebook and many famous brands joining in. Well, advertisers' pressure is without question one key tool available. If you've got a product with a brand that you're proud of, that you're trying to sell to all of us, do you want it to be next to a rabid anti-Semite spewing out his hatred online? I don't think you do. And therefore, if we're pointing that out to the advertisers and asking them to use their pressure on the internet companies, then if I'm owning one of those companies, or I'm a director, I'm a shareholder of them, I'd like my company to do something about it because I don't want my brand polluting. So I think the two voluntary and legalistic approaches can both be used and you need to use what suits your system, your culture the best. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question from the audience and apologies to our viewers who, whose questions we didn't get to. Um, but this last one before turning it back to you, Simone, is from Jamie Green in Atlanta. He says, there are few Jews in large swaths of Britain, but it seems that the labor anti-Semitism scandal weighed on the minds of voters who might have not known many Jews. What do you think accounts for this? The story of the general election in Britain is two parliamentary constituencies, West Bromwich and Derby, two impoverished communities, working class communities. The two cheerleaders of the anti-Semites George Galloway and Christopher Williamson both stood as independent candidates at the election. Both lost their deposit. In other words, got less than 2% of the vote. We should take great encouragement from those two results. The British people spoke and they rejected anti-Semitism. And that was in areas with a large Muslim population, no Jewish population, normal people doing what normal people do. They have the opportunity to support anti-Semitism and what they've done is they've rejected it. And we should be celebrating that. And yes, across the country, anti-Semitism was an issue in every part of the United Kingdom. But I'm proud to say that the British people who fought the Nazis in the 1940s remembered their history, remembered the role that the United Kingdom had for good and for bad 
in the creation of the State of Israel and remembered that our Jewish community are a crucial and equal part of our community and we will stand by them. And normal people did so. And I think that's incredibly empowering and a message that should go widespread. If we stand together, if we all do our small bit, if we cooperate, then we win. What a powerful message uh, for the end. Uh, thank you so much, uh, John, for spending time with us. Uh, it is, as always, uh, such a privilege to be able to spend time with you, uh, to hear from you. I, I really hope that in the next uh, soon future, we'll be able to come together in London. Uh, I'm also glad that our audience was once again able to hear from you in the way we have been cooperating with, uh, with you for many, many years, and I hope for many years to come. Your consistency uh, on the issue of anti-Semitism, your moral courage uh, make you what we call a true mensch. So thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation today. Thank you both for such a fascinating and important conversation. And as always, thank you, Lord Man, for joining us. I'd like to also thank our audience for joining us. If you enjoyed this program, please consider making a donation to AJC at ajc.org slash donate. Thank you. Be well and goodbye.